If you enjoy listening to The Edge, support them by subscribing to The Edge on iTunes, Stitcher, and you can listen through the iHeartRadio app. Get busy listening. This is The Edge. The advantage, it means. They look like to spit on me for no reason. That's horrible. Is there some comfort in uncertainty, do you think? You're a degenerate. Because Australian Shepherds need action. Wow. Yeah. This is The Edge. That's a self-loathing term that I use. For oh, got it. You're listening to The Edge with Mark Thompson. Hi, this is Mark, and welcome to this episode of The Edge. We have Larry Merchant with us. Larry Merchant, the renowned and controversial boxing analyst. He reflects on a life around boxing for decades. He's written about other sports as well. And yes, we'll ask him about the controversial interview with Floyd Mayweather after what had been a very controversial outcome from one of Floyd's fights. And we talked to Larry Merchant in the shadow of the biggest pay-per-view event in history. It was Floyd Mayweather's contest against Conor McGregor, an MMA fighter, wasn't even a boxer, but it was a spectacle. And Larry talks about that as well. Of course, we get into Muhammad Ali. And I ask Larry, honestly, is boxing fixed? Have you ever been around any fight that was fixed? So he talks about that as well. So boxing analyst Larry Merchant for a bulk of the episode. Special thanks to Lisa Fox from iHeartRadio. She joins us for the Larry Merchant conversation. She's great energy and appreciated her hanging out for the first part of that. We start with the Fast 15 and it's really 15 today. Oftentimes it's more or less, but today it is 15 minutes with Michael Shore. We leave aside the Flynn indictments for next week, but we talk about the consolidation of media and the acquisition of Time Magazine. We also talk about the Roy Moore allegations and whether they'll stick. They don't seem to be sticking in that Senate race. So a little taste of politics for the first 15 minutes, and then and then legendary fight analyst Larry Merchant. Hey, thanks those of you who have hit our PayPal button, our virtual tip jar. We appreciate that. And thank you for those who have gone to our website to do your Amazon shopping. You know, you click on the Amazon banner that's on our website, and it's the same Amazon that you'd normally get, only we get a little bit of whatever you spend in that session if you go through our site. So again, our site is Edge dash show.com e d g e dash show.com edge dash show.com thank you for that all monies associated with anything from our amazon monies to paypal money it all stays with this show no one makes any money on this show it is our pleasure to bring it to you and it's our pleasure to bring it to you commercial free and finally thank you for any five-star reviews if you go to itunes you can just put in a five-star review if you don't know what to say just say hey i enjoy this podcast i catch it when i can hey it's great a lot of different guests (laughs) however you want to put it we appreciate it and those reviews believe it or not keep us alive in the iTunes universe. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for downloading. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the show. Let's get started. He comes to us via the Young Turks, via I-24, all the different ways he's been contributing in media with a view on politics, seen him on the network. He is our friend. He knows so much. It's politics and more. It is the Fast 15. It is Michael Shore. Michael Shore, I said, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. Thank you. What an introduction. Thank you so much. And you didn't even say showgirls. Michael, you have been in so many different entertainment projects, but you are, at your core, a political animal. You love politics. I do. And sports. But I like politics because I like it like I like sports. Uh, Well, were it only as innocuous from a societal standpoint as sports? Sports has an impact, but I would suggest that politics has a more lasting impact. Unquestionably, you're right. I mean, you can change the Constitution, which has an impact. If the the Saints win by 11 in the Super Bowl, it doesn't really matter. I want us to get sort of a sense of some of the things that may really change this country. And and you can say certainly this, this country is changing all the time. But one thing this country had and I feel is losing, and I'm curious whether you agree, is a plurality of media ownership that might have created a plurality of opinion, a plurality of information, those things that are required by people in a democracy to make certain decisions about leadership and moving forward. In other words, our view of the world is being shaped by fewer and fewer people who own media, and that, I think, is a bad thing. Yeah, I think it's a bad thing, too. I think that what you run into is a change in the way we get our media, which affects that. So I think we sometimes look back on America and become nostalgic for a way we never were. Well, at a certain time, 
we had three networks and we had a lot of newspapers in every town. We had weeklies, we had monthlies, and we had dailies. So there were a lot of agencies putting out their news, and ownership of that wasn't as either threatened or challenged. As media got bigger and bigger, these conglomerates happened because it was the only way for smaller newspapers and news outlets to survive because the competition was just that stiff. I mean, it's one of the pitfalls of capitalism is what's happened to media. With that, there is a lot that we've lost, obviously. Stop right there, because I want yeah. to make sure I understand. So as these small independent newspapers were struggling, yeah. they needed to be acquired by other big money media companies to survive. Exactly. And not to mention, then technology got in the way. So you don't wait for a weekly newspaper to show up anymore. My God, if you got a weekly newspaper, you would be so behind the news. If there was an evening paper, you wouldn't really be caught. You'd, or you'd probably already know about it because there used to be two presses of major papers. So you'd have the morning news and the evening news. When I was a kid, and it wasn't that long ago, the New York Post came out in the afternoon, which was different than their morning edition in a lot of ways, and the Daily News and others. So the fact that we consume news in such different ways means that the only way for a lot of these outlets to survive was either to sell, to fold, or to become part of a group. And I think that's a very simplified way of explaining what's happened, but it is certainly at the root of how we end up where we are. The reason we're talking about this this time in this episode is we had touched on the fact there was a huge broadcast company that was buying up tons of television stations across the country, and they are a, a right-wing media group called Sinclair Broadcasting. We again, Correct. We, yeah, we, we did talk about that. We, t we touched on that, and the fact that they were going to make certain that the right-wing agenda was represented in the news that it was covered. And, yeah. and so that's a, a stated goal that is associated with, on a daily basis, what they call must-runs, where they're insisting that certain things be run in the local news, right. and certain editorials run in the local news, and this kind of thing. So, obviously, the, your information, if you just watch these local stations that Sinclair owns, and again, they're going to own a majority, is going to be dramatically affected by that. So, add to that the fact that now Time Magazine has been sold to the Koch brothers, to a company that is controlled in large measure by the billionaire Koch brothers. Right. Meredith is what they're called. Correct. Well, Meredith is, is a big corporation, and they the Kochs are putting a ton of money into this deal. How will this affect my better homes and gardens is what I want to know. <laughs> well, it'll look a lot more. Meredith's based in Iowa, so it's going to be your your garden's going to be a lot simpler. There will be corn growing in it. I, you know, I don't know how it'll affect better homes and gardens, Mark. But I, I and I don't even know that we can predict how this will affect anything. I mean, the Koch brothers, of course, they insist that Meredith insists that they have no editorial control at all, which is both possible and reason for people to be skeptical. It's totally believable that the Koch brothers will have, no, they are investors at their core. If they think this is a good business deal, they will get into it. It is totally believable that they want zero control over Time Magazine. I mean, that is a believable premise. However, we also can believe just as easily that the Koch brothers are using this as they use so many of the entities in which they become involved as a vehicle to get their message and their type of politic across, their type of profile. And the inadvertent parts of what happened, even if the Koch brothers are not exerting influence outwardly, there's an inadvertent part of it where if you are a writer for Time Magazine, the Koch brothers are part owner of the magazine for whom you work, and you have a chance to write a profile that is favorable or unfavorable of someone, but you think there's a risk in writing the unfavorable, you're going to write the favorable. Perhaps. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot because journalists don't generally care about that, to, to be frank. That's not what, what brings people to the craft of being a journalist. But the water becomes muddy is what I'm saying, because all of what I said just now could be right. All of it could be wrong. But it's so much easier when you know what is right and when the Cokes aren't involved and you know that there isn't that pressure. And that's the problem. Where do you get your information as this world becomes increasingly muddy, as you say? I sort of get it from all over. I mean, I still read newspapers. I read actual newspapers. I read newspapers from cities that I like online. For example, I'll read the Miami Herald because I like Miami and I like the writers of the Miami Herald. I'll read the Daily Progress because I went to school in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I think they report on that place really well. I'll read my local paper, the Los Angeles Times. I'll read 
the New York Times and I'll read the Washington Post. I don't read the Wall Street Journal. But A, because I'm terrified of what I don't know and I don't know finance and I, I'm not, I've never intrigued by it. So, and I don't like their bent usually, but that's not really fair because I don't read them. So it's, it's when people tell me that they, how they are, it's not because of how I, my experience. Do you, have you heard anything as to whether the Koch brothers are going to continue with the Sports Illustrated sexiest swimsuit? As long as they're not in it, I think we're fine, right? I mean, <laughs> so there are these... oh, there's so many things you can go, right? The, the, the sexiest man in the world, People Magazine. Yeah, right? thank you. Yeah. And that, well, that, that has to continue, Michael. Right. Well, I mean, going from Please. Blake Shelton to Charles Koch is going to be, it's going to be a jump, but it was on people's minds before they even bought it. When Mark. every year it's Donald Trump. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's really well, the Koch be. brothers, for their part, they, they're not Trump fans. No. That is true. That is true. If they had their druthers, this would not be how things wound up. They would have been happy with Ted Cruz, probably. Yeah, they'd have been happy with Ted Cruz. They'd have been super happy, I think, with Marco Rubio. I want to ask you about congressional misdeeds in the world of sexual harassment. And I say misdeed, it really is one of those terms that takes down what can be some pretty nasty things when they paid out millions and millions of dollars. These are not misdeeds. These are crimes. Right. Involved in the world of, of sexual abuse and sexual harassment. They involve interns. They involve pages, all of these things. We don't really know what they involve because, right. and this gets to my point, as this stuff bubbles to the surface involving Conyers and- Al Con- Frank and thank John you. Conyers. It goes back further. Mark Foley, a representative from Florida who resigned ultimately for you know, having untoward relationship with a page in the House. So there's a history of it that predates the ones that are so well known currently. And- This complaint was filed against Conyers, and the congressional office that handles this complaint, as we now learn, has settled, settled now, a total of 264 complaints for $17.2 million over 20 years. Yeah, since 1995. In 1995, Bill Clinton signed into law something called the Congressional Accountability Act, and what it was was... It was leveling the playing field so that members of Congress had to live by the same standards uh, as people and people who worked in government as everyday Americans do with the same same laws, legal protections and rights as workers. That that didn't pre-exist. They they sort of had this, uh, I don't know, they were an oasis of law up there, even though they were the ones that made the law. And it's not to say that it was lawlessness, but it was just they were held to a different standard than we were. And that was what the Clinton administration wanted to change. A lot of it spurred by, by Al Gore, the vice president at the time, who was kind of given charge of government reform in a big way, and that was part of it. Anyway, what it did was was create an atmosphere under which people could go after members of Congress or their superiors in Congress, uh, even if they weren't members of Congress. You know, if you worked in an office with a very difficult legislative aide who was making life uncomfortable for you and was making sexual comments all day, you had the right to go after them. What it didn't do was make it as easy as it is necessarily to walk into the HR department and stop the presses at a, at a, at a you know, if you worked for a tire manufacturer, that's how it would most likely go. There are so many delays in the process when you do it in Congress and so many ways for them to fix it before it actually becomes a case and gets out. That's what we're learning about it now. And so that's a major fault in it is that if you know you were uh, felt if you felt like that legislative aid was talking sexually in front of you, it made you uncomfortable, you'd have to go to a compliance office, and that would sit there for 30 days, and then you'd have to see what your rights were for another 30 days, and then there are 30 days of unexplainable delays, and then there's time for a response, and then, I mean, so you have to really jump through hoops to make it happen, and during that time, let's say it's 90 days, right? Nothing changes. You still got to work with this odious person who's, you know, making these sexual references in front of you that make you uncomfortable. Well, that's that's a fault. And, I, and they're learning about it, that that's a flaw. I think it probably had great intentions, but it's certainly like so much in, in, in Congress is carried out so ineffectively. And that's a great step-by-step on what happens. In addition, Michael, isn't there an issue as to not knowing where all this money is going, or should that be done under a cloak of secrecy? Well, I think they, that that was designed to be a victim's protection, you know, do not disclose, uh, non-disclosure thing. So I think that was probably designed to, to protect the victim, but what it does do is you say these enormous numbers of people. At the University of Virginia, where I went to school, they have an honor system, and when a student is asked to leave, there's a little thing in the Cavalier Daily, which was the paper 
paper there that said a third-year student was asked to leave the university on an honor violation. You never know who that person was, what the settlement was. You only know the numbers of, at the end of the year, how many people left were, were asked to leave on honors violation. So it, in a sense, it was trying to replicate that to protect the student. They did it at UVA here to protect the complainant, the plaintiff. I guess they did it in that way, but it, it's sort of, it's taxpayer dollars. And I think a lot of people find it discomforting. I don't know the way around it, though. I mean, you can complain about it, say it's a lot of money. I don't know where it goes. It's my taxpayer dollars used to settle these suits on behalf of Congress people. But if you're the person who made that complaint and you don't want the world to know that you did this and you undid John Conyers because of how he treated you, then there's another side to that coin. Yeah, because of the kind of situation associated with these settlements, that is to say, uh, sexual misconduct, it does create a sensitivity around it that sure. is different yeah. than what you might find elsewhere. Exactly. I want to tell you that I was at a party and I was pulled over to the side by a guy who goes, hey, I listened to your podcast. And I really enjoy it. For real. That's yeah. great. And I said, oh, thank you so much. And he said, I really like the Fast 15 with Michael Shore. Wow. And he said, you know, Michael's doesn't have an agenda particularly politically. And he kind of just gives you the, his, he said, I really, I really enjoy it. So I wanted to pass that on to you. Oh, that's great. I love yeah. to hear that. And thank you to whoever that is. And we love doing it. I mean, I love sitting here and talking to Mark when the mic's off. So we have a good time when the mics are on. And, and I, love, I love a live audience, too. Do you, you're going to cover the Roy Moore Yeah, I'm going to case. be there election night. That's one of those that I don't trust until they say, it's done, right? It feels like the polls aren't yeah. real. I mean, I don't, have, I don't have much of an agenda when I come on the Fast 15. I'm not a big fan of guns, and I think that's pretty clear. I really don't like Roy Moore, and he should not be in Congress, and I don't think I'm going out on a partisan limb by saying that. You know, If Luther Strange were running, I wouldn't be as, as passionate. I also happen to think Doug Jones is terrific, but I, this Roy Moore's a bad guy. Michael? We love spending time with you, and we look forward to the next time. The Fast 15 has concluded. Michael Shore, everybody. Come on. Oh, thank you all. Thank you all so very much. Thanks oh, all. Awesome. Well, Goodbye. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. I want to thank you for all the ways that you support my friends on the edge. And if you haven't already, why don't you show your support and subscribe? What's the matter with you? Go to Edge Show. Oh, it's Edge Dash. What the, what's with the dash? Stupid. All right, let me edge-show.com stupid why is that dash edge-show.com i'm excited to have the greatest boxing analyst of all time with us larry merchant everybody come on wow this is really cool larry merchant thank you for being here Thank you for that introduction, although it sounds a little bit like the Mayweather fake fight. Oh, oh no! <laughs> well, I mean, a few weeks ago. <laughs> Look, you're in the Boxing Hall of Fame. You're in multiple Boxing Halls of Fame, and you're really very well respected, and you speak your mind. I think that's one of the reasons that a lot of people give you a hard time, because guys who tell it straight get a lot of shit from people. So um, True that. Uh, once upon a time, I was very lucky to have fellow named Seth Abraham as my boss, the head of sports at HBO. And uh, he said to me, uh, you know, you caused me a lot of problems, meaning that something I said or didn't say might have bruised a fighter or his followers or his promoter who complained. And then uh, Seth Abraham added, but keep doing what you do. And that's a rare thing in the corporate environment mm -hmm. when they're willing to take those risks. And what's the one thing you can say that you know that will always piss off a boxer? <laughs> oh, like a catchphrase to make him mad? <laughs> Just the one no, thing. I, I don't even, I, I can't say there's anything. It's, it's, they expect that they have a contract with the network. I was a newspaper man a long time ago when nothing was expected in this regard, but I'm part of a network that's paying them a lot of money, and they and their followers and handlers assume that means that we're going to be uh, starry-eyed with every step they take. Kissing their you-know-what, yeah. Well, we're going to be part of their entourage. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you mention this because I do think that's what's happened to sideline reporters and commentators. They've become co-opted by the very thing that they're supposed to be reporting on. You know, the Larry Merchant post-fight interviews are famous, and we can get to the controversial one with Mayweather and all the rest, But and you look forward to them because he was going to ask the boxers what really happened in the ring. Now you get, how do you feel? Right, you tell, know? Me, tell me what you were thinking. Yeah, what's going through your 
your mind right now. You know, you just, it's like, it's, I hate the interviews now. So, Larry, I think that that thing you did where you kind of, you know, were speaking truth to power a little bit in the ring, it was, it set you apart. Well, I came, thank you. Uh, I came from a different tradition than uh, most of the commentators, which is that I was a journalist, a columnist for many years, and that's just how I'm wired. And um, um, there were, yes, there was truth, but sometimes there was consequences. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, look, your controversial interview with Floyd Mayweather, what were the circumstances of that fight? Well, he was fighting a young, attractive fighter named Victor Ortiz, and Ortiz got frustrated by Mayweather's uh, boxing ability and attacked him and um, on the ropes and in the process kind of act somewhere between accidentally and deliberately uh, headbutted him. And there was a timeout called and, and there was a point deducted and the referee lost control of what happened. And Mayweather took advantage of the situation when Ortiz looked away at the referee and uh, hit him with what I, what I call the legal sucker punch. Now, if you were out in the audience, all you saw was one guy not looking, uh, the fight virtually stopping, and then the opponent hitting him a sucker punch. And so it was a very volatile situation, explosive, a lot of Ortiz fans there. And when I got into the ring uh, and I was going to interview him, this volatility kept rising and rising to a crescendo. And that was the atmospherics around the interview. And Mayweather, who was a very quick study of stuff going on in and out of the ring, understood that he was going to get more discredit than credit for the way the fight ended. And he attacked me personally in the interview, in which I hadn't even gotten to the hard questions yet. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what, what was the thing that you said that then set him off? Well, that was one of the things that set me off, that there was nothing that I said that it was just I wasn't yet ready to get to some of what was going on, but while he uh, he wanted to celebrate the win, controversy that was unfolding as we spoke, and what he said to me was, uh, "You don't know uh, anything about not um, anything being uh, a euphemism about boxing and HBO or to fire you." And that was a personal attack. I had had many fighters who were not completely thrilled with my interviews, but this is the first time anybody had attacked me personally, and I intuitively counterpunched. Let's go to Larry with Floyd Mayweather. Thank you, Jim. Uh, congratulations, Floyd. You hear the crowd. At least a good part of it is in an uproar because they felt that you took shots at him unfairly after you went together in the ring, made up for the headbutt, and then you poked him. Uh, What's your story? Uh, first off, I want to thank God for, for this victory. Because uh, without God, all this wouldn't be possible. I want to thank my team. Um, I got hit with a dirty shot. And um, it's protect yourself at all times. Um, I hit him with a left foot right hand. And that ended the bout. So you're saying that even though it appeared that he didn't, wasn't protecting himself and thought that that was part of the ceremony that you were going through of apology, that you unfairly took advantage of it. What do you say to those who say, what'd you do there? You were winning the fight and in I, charge. I just want to say everybody that bought pay-per-view, that came out to Las Vegas, thank you. Anyway, anyway, it was a hell of a fight. Floyd, you know you're a promoter, but now we're talking to you as a prize fighter. Let's take a look at what happened at the end of the fight. Oh, let's look and at you it. describe it. We touched, we touched gloves, we back to fight hook, right hand, and that's all she wrote. So it, it, for you, it was just an automatic response. Let's get on with the fight. It's protect yourself at all times. He done something dirty. Uh, we're not here to cry and complain about what he did dirty or what I did dirty. I was victorious. If he wanted a rematch, he can get a rematch. You were in charge of the fight. 
you were aggressive and taking advantage of what you, know you saw what I'm, as you a You know what I'm going to do? Because you don't ever give me a fair shake. You know that? So I'm going to let you talk to Victor Ortiz, all right? I'm through. They put somebody else up and give me an interview. What talk are you to Victor talking Ortiz. about? What you, are you, you talking heard about? Him. You never give me a fair shake. HBO needs to fire you. You don't know shit about box. You ain't shit. You're, you're not shit. I wish I was 50 years younger you and I'd care. kick your ass. You won't do shit. You won't do nothing. Well, yeah, here's, the thing. It, here's the thing. <laughs> uh, there were many journalists who had questioned the choice of opponents, let me put it that way, that Mayweather had made along the way. He was a brilliant matchmaker for himself uh, in knowing which opponents would attract the most viewers and would pose the least threat. And um, he had these problems with many of them. But my representing HBO magnified that. And so in that occasion, he attacked me on camera and um, I responded. And it turned out to be something I knew uh, 15 seconds after I left the ring would be no lower than the second paragraph of my obituary. <laughs> yeah, it, it did stick with you for sure. Which isn't bad, by the way. That's a pretty good line to have in the second line of your obituary. <laughs> well, <laughs> I didn't really, I had to be told by people what it meant to them. And, to, and the majority of the people who uh, weren't thrilled with Mayweather's character and personality to begin with, much less his uh, purest fighting or boxing style, uh, they said, well, you stood up to a bully. And when I thought about it, I said, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that, well, that was that was the appeal to me. And I was looking online, too, looking at a lot of the commentary from, from a couple of these videos that are, of course, online everywhere. And a lot of folks, uh, more people were on your side, uh, but some folks said, hey, well, you know, he's right. That's, uh, you know, strong words from a man, you, Larry, um, well, who's never unusual. actually been in the boxing ring yourself. Well, it's an unusual exchange, let me put it that way. And yeah, my grandson, who was uh, who, who came to that fight, told me the next day that I was trending past Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I don't know what that means, but okay. No. Look, man. By the time I got to dinner that night, there were already T-shirts on the internet with um, Merchant versus Mayweather. Uh, <laughs> I would have loved a shirt like that. I didn't know that was available. I would have loved that shirt. You know, look, uh, Floyd Mayweather is viewed as somebody who, as Larry said, has set up these fights where he doesn't really stand likely to lose to the opponent and then the fight itself kind of is, has a frustrating no fight quality to it i mean well it's a uh, yes it, it was it uh, i used to say that the action uh, stopped as soon as the first bell rang it was more about the build-up to the fight and he got away with it and he he promoted himself as a villain he, he had villainous characteristics, and um, he knew what the new world of communication was. He had he connected himself to rap stars. Yeah, and he, he saw the whole playing field. And, and made uh, extraordinary amounts of money because he did. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to Mayweather and Conor McGregor in a second, but just because you mentioned it, do you think we do look past the sometimes huge sins, for lack of a better word, of a lot of these athletes? Like, you know, Floyd Mayweather was convicted of domestic battery, wasn't he? Well, convicted and, and charged on many occasions. And you, you can go to Mike Tyson, and there's a, you know, there was a bad boy thing that goes on in sports, and, and not only in sports, uh, and, but if if the guy delivers in some way, uh, as Tyson did, um, um, who certainly was not a saint and, and, and so on, um, it, 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 people will overlook it. Look, uh, many great novelists and artists and, and others in the high culture uh, um, had bad boy images and, and, and real lives um, which were overlooked if what they did moved people. Is it weird to see Mike Tyson with a one-man show now? <laughs> Well, he's now doing a reprise, a second one man show. He's doing it really well. It is a little amazing. I would not have uh, predicted that long range. He's got some good agents. Mike Tyson. <laughs> and by the way, to me, as a professional, uh, the best interview I ever did was after uh, Buster Douglas upset him in Tokyo. And that was because Buster Douglas was so broken up and emotional, his mother having died a couple of weeks before, his having achieved this monumental upset, that he, he couldn't talk on camera. He, 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 he couldn't gather himself. 
but he was visibly trying and visibly wanted to communicate what he was thinking, what he went through, and so on. And I told myself at that moment, this is show and tell. And what this is showing on television is more important than anything that I could say. And there was maybe 20 or 25 seconds of airtime in which there were no words spoken, that the picture showed the emotions of the moment. And I just stood, to me, that's when I became professional. That's when I made the full transition from the printed word to the spoken or, in that occasion, unspoken word. Yeah, to a real broadcaster. You got the moment. Yes, and if you notice that on some occasions now, uh, uh, um, television will allow the the emotion of the moment, the crowd noise, um, the sights of the, the what's going on in the dugout and so on, to carry the story, the narrative of the event. Let me ask you about seeing the fight. When you're in the arena, has everybody in this room been in a, ever seen a fight live? I've never seen a live fight, no. Yeah. no Josh, right. no. Yeah. I, I have, uh, and I was at that tyson Hollyfield fight where he bit the ear off. That was wild. Ooh. I was in the 12th row, which was, it was like the best seat I've ever had. I think I was a, uh, in the ringside of the Bernard Hopkins fight. But anyway, blah, blah, blah. What I want to ask you is, when you're at home watching it, on, NFL, you're better at home watching it on TV than you are to be, at, I think, than to be at the stadium. With boxing, do you get a true view of what you're, what's happening when you're watching it on television, or is it better to be in the arena? I suppose it depends a little bit on where you're sitting. Listen, um, the British, a very attractive heavyweight champion, Anthony Joshua, has just fought before 90,000 people in London where he beat Vladimir Klitschko, and then 70,000 people in Wales. I can assure you that if they didn't have these huge monitors that you can watch the fight in these arenas, that half or two-thirds of the people couldn't really see what the fight was about, which, incidentally, is the way most, almost everybody saw events and sports before television, Right. right? Sure. But they wanted to be a part of something. They wanted to be viscerally, emotionally invested in the event. They wanted to be part of some kind of, of county fair, if you will, to be there with other people in a, in a communal situation, rooting for or against. So, yes, being a part of it and not getting, you may not get every subtlety uh, that you would get on television uh, or on a monitor. But I, listen, I was at a, a, a Jackson concert at the Dodger Stadium years ago, and I found myself having to look at the monitor really at, at times to see what was what was going on, what his movements really were. And I had a pretty good seat. Michael Jackson or which which Jackson? Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Not Bo Jackson. (laughs) But when you're ringside telecasting a fight, are you watching a monitor or are you watching what's happening in the ring? Uh, I would say 90% just watching what's happening in the ring. Then we get replays and uh, to get the subtleties of what happened and whether which punch caused the damage or which punch just grazed the fighter and and so on. So the, the monitor is there for a reason, but I'm there for a reason too, which is to have my reaction to what I am seeing and feeling at the moment. Larry, when you watch fights now, A, do you watch fights and B, do you, are you kind of like doing your own little play-by-play in your head while you're watching now that you're retired? and uh, Sort of. <laughs> I, I, I most often watch without sound. In, in fact, I look, in, back in the day, I've covered everything you could imagine. Uh, Wimbledon 15 times or so, many World Series, Super Bowls, Olympics, and whatever there is, I covered. And um, I have my own ideas. Sometimes I want to hear what's going on. Very often I don't. And um, so that I have... Uh, I might have my television on as a, a background landscape for a, a, some kind of an event while I'm reading and looking up, and um, I'm able to uh, speed watch, so to speak, uh, because of all the experience I've had. It's really wild that you, you did start as sort of a general assignment reporter years ago. In, was it in New York? No, I was a columnist at the New York Post. Okay, that's it. Okay. And before that, I was a columnist and sports editor of the Philadelphia Daily News. Okay, I see. You were then covering a lot of different things, these things that you're talking about. You were covering them as a journalist for a long time. When did the boxing focus come in? Well, I 
was covering boxing just as I was covering every other sport. But boxing lends itself to a particular kind of insights and and, and writing. What had always attracted me to boxing was the great writers who wrote about it, and uh, um, in which you can you can't hide from who you are when you're in the ring, and you're alone there, naked, and and you're showing oh, what what you're made of, and the, not just physically, but in in every way. And so it's a great sport to write about. Uh, between events, and uh, and then I had the good luck to be around during the time of Muhammad Ali. I had once invested uh, be, before I was in New York. I had invested as a stunt in Joe Namath's company. You mean Joe Frazier's company? What was his company? Well, it was a group of people who got together after he won the Olympic gold medal in 1964 to enable him, because he already had a small family, to quit his job in a uh, slaughterhouse, which incidentally is uh, where we've seen the the episodes in Sylvester Stallone's Rocky movies. And and they were putting together $20,000, $250 a share. And I, as a columnist, I wrote about him as a co-owner just to have some fun with it. But Ali came along and was this larger-than-life figure for a long time. And I was one of the dogs barking at the parade that never stopped with him and writing about it. Uh, And then HBO came along, and and they asked me if I would do something on boxing. uh, No, NBC first. Well, they got back into boxing because of Ali. Boxing had gone into a trough, as it often does. And, um, and to give you a comparison, it was uh, uh, Ali was to boxing as as the Broadway show Hamilton is to Broadway. Sure. Uh, it, it helped to revive it, and I and and I happened to be there at the time. And so, and Ali needed Frazier, right during that time. Well, he didn't need him, but but every fighter needs a great opponent, and they couldn't be more opposite to each other than they were in terms of their styles as athletes and in in terms of their characters and personalities. And so, this was at a time when the country itself was divided with all of the the various movements, the civil rights movements, the feminist movements, the anti-war movements. So they, Ali deliberately was part of that hot political time. And Joe Fraser um, was perceived as as an opposite of Ali, which uh, and was cast in his role as a standing uh, for the establishment. It's so a they bit, were natural a, rivals, uh, and their first and third fights were the, among the greatest uh, fights ever. So, But as it related to me personally, I, I, I'd gone to NBC, and they said, well, we got to get back in the fighting business. And they looked around the office, and I was the only guy around who had ever done anything on fights. Wow. So I got hired, and um, that was my good fortune, and uh, onward and upward. What a rocket ship that was during that time. I mean, you really did hop that train. It was the right train leaving the station. Well, it was the most amazing parade in, ever, and um, Ali was just an extraordinary once-in-a-lifetime character. My father saw him fight, fight in Puerto Rico. This was before the layoff. I remember I was just a little kid, and my dad said, that this guy is amazing because he is a heavyweight, and he could, with the, that left jab is what my dad was talking about, like bam, 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 bam. He well, said, what, what literally didn't see it. him exceptional was that he was one of the, the new breed of big, fast athletes that were coming into all sports. And he, as a heavyweight, he weighed about 210, 212 pounds, who could move like a like a welterweight, and yet was extraordinarily courageous, but also was a great showman. Yeah, he was a talker. During and after fights, and everybody was drawing up sides. Were you for this? Was he a phony? Was he a real heavyweight? Was he just a showman? 
Uh, and that was in the air for a long time because the old boxing establishment had never seen anything quite like him and, and didn't know what to make of him. Well, he was the, he was the real thing, though. Well, when Joe was... Frazier fought him, uh, everybody found, uh, found out, fought him after Ali was exiled from the sport for three years because of his stand on Vietnam. And everyone saw the, the punishment that he was willing to absorb as well as deal out and how brave he really was despite the fact that he moved like Barishnikov in the ring. Um, that's when it turned people's minds around about who he really was. And was he, was he the greatest heavyweight? In my mind, yes, because of the, his opposition. He fought the best fighters and he fought them multiple times. Joe Frazier three times, Foreman, Floyd Patterson, a former champion, twice, and other really top fighters. He didn't win every single time, but he fought and then he refought. And um, prize fighting has never seen anything quite like that in a, in a heavyweight division. And were you on the record? Were you writing when he was at the end of his career and fighting the two, oh, yeah. the two I, or three fights too many? Did, were you feeling that I'm way? not the very end of his career. By that time, I was no longer writing. And um, uh, I had covered two of his, two of his fights on television um, one at Madison Square Garden and one in Germany. But I wasn't there for the very, very end. I had I had left to come out to uh, Hollywood to make my other next fortune. And um, but it's that to me is the arc of almost all champions um, who stay a little bit long at the party, and um, maybe the rest of us do too. Yeah, but there's a different level of sadness when it's a boxer. Uh, I think that that's fair, but I think that uh, one of the things about the boxer is he knows what he's going into. He may he may be thinking he's still 25 when he's 35, as he watches his uh, opponents or future opponents perform and and believes that he can compete with them. But also he loves the life of the fighter. He wants to be on stage. The money is often a big part of it. A lot of people stay too long, and you're right, it, it can be sad at the end, but that's what they sign up for. Right. Larry Holmes talking about that fight in which Ali would not go down, and he was just, Heart you know. Heartbroken as yeah, he was beating it, him, yeah. I'd say it's, it's an emotional moment when he's talking about it, you know. Well, I saw Larry Holmes in Africa before the Foreman fight when he was a sparring partner for Ali. So you can see how deep that can run sometimes. Sure, he idolized him. As many of his opponents did. I get it. I once interviewed, gosh, why is the name jumped out of my head, the president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, Mandela, Mandela yeah. who had been a star amateur fighter and who had followed Ali from prison for most of his career. And I asked Mandela, I said, how does a man who has led uh, his movement of nonviolence become such a big boxing fan? the most violent of sports. And he thought about it for a moment, and he just said, boxers know what they're getting into. Unlike, for example, football players did for a very long time. Right, right. You couldn't become a boxer and n not know that uh, this was a dangerous game. Right, that it was taking a toll on you, and the older you got and the right. slower your reflexes, right. the more of a toll it was going to take. Yeah, it's about causing head injuries. So. Right. What is the state of uh, boxing now? Well, um, if you're asking about a U.S. or you're asking about the world, uh, like other, some other sports and many other things, it, it's globalized. There are, in, in countries like... Uh, Russia produces great fighters from the old amateur sports infrastructure that was built to uh, find Olympic champions. And it's big in Japan and it's in Great Britain. But uh, I'm, I was looking in, in just to, doing a little homework here before we went on the air. In Ring Magazine, the U.S. has uh, 40, or if you include Puerto Rico, 44 ranked fighters. And the next countries behind the U.S. or Great Britain, where there's been a tremendous revitalization of interest in a, in a country that originated prize fighting as we know it. Mexico, where which is the heart of uh, boxing in North America and the Mex with Mexican Americans, uh, has 23 ranked fighters. America had 40. Uh, Japan has 50. So it's worldwide. 
but there are a lot of really good American fighters. But it's not the mainstream sport it once was. Neither is horse racing, neither is tennis as a spectator sport. Neither are other things. Stuff changes. Baseball has been overtaken by football and basketball, presumably. So um, it's not mainstream, but like Broadway, which has often been pronounced dead, uh, it sometimes uh, sits up as a very lively corp. Um, when a Hamilton comes along, everybody is a fan of Broadway. When an Ali comes along, everybody's a fan of boxing. Um, and maybe there will be that kind of figure. But there's a hardcore audience of fans. And in the last two weekends, for example, there have been five or six television shows devoted on Showtime, HBO, and ESPN to boxing. Now, somebody's watching those shows, somebody's making money on those shows, but the average fan, the little old lady from Dubuque, only gets interested when there are, when there's a Jack Dempsey or a Joe Lewis or a Muhammad Ali or a Tyson or others I could name. And boxing is awaiting that kind of character. I think it's fair to say that uh, Mayweather achieved his stature because we haven't had an American heavyweight of of importance in uh in decades so i so don't know how, filled that void really just i to, don't know how to ca- yes i don't know how to characterize where it's at except it ain't what it used to be <laughs> but, um, it ain't, but it ain't when dead every town had a boxing gym where factory workers or field workers could come and work out and from that quantity came quality and from the quality came excellence and fans and and where it was really uh, an important part of popular culture, but it isn't anymore. And uh, at the same time, uh, individuals come along who can captivate you, and it's such an elemental sport that you can watch it twice and think you know it as well as the guy who's watch it, watched it 2,000 times. That's a great point. Well, you watch boxing and you think, I can follow this, I can tell who's winning just by the number of... Yeah, well, <laughs> I once said on the air after some there was some big controversy, you said you can't fix boxing and you can't kill it. Um, something always comes along that changes our mind, at least for the moment. Most recently, it would have been the, the, the Golovkin-Canelo uh, Alvarez fight which was a really big deal. And what happened there? It turned out to be a really good fight. (laughs) And for once, a fight that got hyped was the real thing. And the decision, which was questioned, was a draw. I, I happened to be there with the same grandson that was there with me at the um, Mayweather fight. Boy, he picked the right grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to him after the 10th round, well, if Canelo can do that for two more rounds, we're going to have a really close decision, and it turned out to be a draw. And they're going to do it again. So I'm uh, happy that's going to happen. Yeah. You know, for years they talk about the fact that boxing is filled with corruption and that fights are fixed, some of them, not all of them, but uh, but even at the highest levels and even big promoters like Don King has mentioned as you know, I'm asking in all of your time there, had you ever been a witness to a fight where you thought, wow, for the first time I'm seeing that something here could be fixed or that the outcome might have been predetermined? Well, there used to be a time when fight fixes were a part of the economic reality of the sport, which is why it was always called or the red light district of sports, that the people who controlled boxing back back in the day uh, often could make more money betting on a fight than they could on the revenue that the fight generated. Sure. And so there, there was an incentive to fix fights. And uh, fighters were told, well, if you go down in this fight, that you'll get some other fight that you wanted. And I happened, as a young man, I went to see the great boxer, Willie Pep at Madison Square Garden, and he got knocked out in the second round, and it turned out to be a fix. In the modern times, there are what I call not direct fixes in terms of a fighters being told you're going to lose, okay? It's what I call a kind of corporate fix um, by the matchmaking, by the fact that a fighter can be such a huge attraction that the emotion of the crowd can influence an event. The subconscious feelings of officials toward um, 
wanting to see the big promoter with the big, consciously or not, as I said, do well because they'll be back. But direct fixes, I have not seen one in all the years since I saw Willie Pep. At um, Madison Square Garden that day, yeah. Right. And are, are there questionable decisions? The hometown d- decision is built into the economy of boxing. A hometown kid, a popular fighter, is popular for a particular reason. Maybe he has an ethnic rooting base. Uh, maybe he f- has a fan-friendly a style for television, a big personality, and that in a close fight, he'll get the benefit of the doubt because of of that, because it's generally, quote, good for boxing. I remember that with De La Hoya, there were some kind of... Well, people felt that way, but at the same time, uh, he lost two close, hellacious fights to Shane Mosley. Manny Pacquiao was a huge attraction and, and lost the fight that virtually everybody in the arena, including his opponent, Bradley, thought that he had won. Uh, Sometimes that just happens because people have a different view from from where they sit. Sure. Um, And there are controversial decisions. But they usually favor the guy who is the biggest attraction because it's a business as well as a sport. And um, there are emotional factors that go into it, subconscious factors that go into it. I don't. And yes, promoters like Don King tried to play, play those notes, try to uh, let people in the game know that it's good for them if their guy wins. But uh, at the same time, maybe referees can get involved in some way. That's, sure, that's a part of the game, and you're saying that these are sort of externals that aren't... aren't... Well, sometimes it can be uh, more direct. If I've seen anything in, in the ring that I have found curious, there is a, was a, a tradition in boxing. Uh, um, it, it, there's, a criti- there's a crazy part of boxing in which the promoters directly... The commissions supposedly pick who the officials are. But all their expenses and all their fees are paid for by the promoter. That doesn't happen in any of this sport. And there are other signals that can be sent out that that weak, the weak flesh, uh, which is mostly to protect the self and so on, can act on. But the, the tradition I wanted to speak to was of fighters, quote, tipping referees who get paid very modest amounts, even for big fights, to make sure that their best interests are not disserved. Hey, keep it fair, huh? All right? <laughs> keep it fair, huh? Now, supposedly, and George, I think George Foreman wrote this in a book, he tipped the referee for the, for the, for the, the big fight with Ali in Zaire. Really? $25,000. Wow. And then found out that Ali had tipped him $35,000. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, and this is a true Ali story, I flew down, I flew to uh, Zaire on a flight with Ali. And we, we flew from, if I remember correctly, from New York to Paris, where we connected to a, a Zairean airline. <laughs> um, about an hour into the flight, Ali goes in to the cockpit and gets on a loudspeaker system and starts to poke fun at the fact that there are two black pilots on the plane <laughs> and saying, are they going to be able to find Zaire? Are they going to be able to land the plane? He is just having fun and we're all <laughs> his- hysterical, basically. He comes out of the cockpit and he sits down next to me. And I had known him for a long time. And and I, like many others, had a personal connection with him. And he said to me, if he doesn't get me in seven, his parachute won't open. And what he was saying was the only flaw in Foreman was his stamina. Right which may have been pointed out to him by his trainer, Angelo Dundee, or whatever. And he was saying that if he stays in there with him, 
that will be a deciding factor. What happened in the fight, the famous rope-a-dope, Ali letting Foreman and taunting Foreman into punching himself out was based on, I, I believe at the time and still do, on that conviction of right. Ali. He was just going to run out of gas. And, and when did Ali stop him? In the eighth round. Now, you could say that was a fix, but it was a one-man fix <laughs> that Foreman was not in on. Unreal. And that's a pretty, it's still a bold strategy to think that you can stand there and get hit by well, George Foreman for seven that, rounds. To understand that uh, a lot of guys understood Foreman's <laughs> one issue, but uh, their issue was staying in there long enough. Right, those seven rounds and aren't Ali short. Ali could, Im- could imagine doing it in that way and surviving long enough to execute his plan. Well, you know, the stunt that Mayweather put together recently, you know, the uh, Conor McGregor fight, was just that. It was viewed by many people, and I'm sure yourself among them, as sort of a, you know, this is not even a fight. It's just a a stunt. It was very well watched. Big moneymaker. Did it last longer than you thought it would? Or McGregor actually, it seemed early on, had some boxing skills. But that's, again, from a total, I'm just a civilian. I think that was... That was uh, Floyd letting it happen? Yes. I mean, he understood the moment and the, that that everybody, well, people like me, even the, the cynics as well as the skeptics, uh, would say, look, if this was a, a fought under MMA rules, that, I, that, that he wouldn't have a chance. Sure, that Floyd wouldn't have had a chance. Right, would not have had a chance. Um, and similarly, McGregor didn't have a chance in a boxing contest. I mean, that was as clear as anything. And um, Floyd understood that a lot of people were paying a lot of money and they didn't want to see a two or three round fight. And so I, and this is, this also is nothing new in boxing either. He carried him for a while. Right. Um, I can remember being told the story of Sugar Ray Robinson once being told he could get a thousand dollars for the radio rights to a fight if he let it go the distance. It went the distance. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, and I and I guess a lot of uh, a lot of people felt they got their money's worth. And hey, that's showbiz, right? That, not, yeah. it's not they fight. It's not prize fighting, but it, it has its impact on prize fighting. If you're a distributor, if you're any kind of a person involved in showbiz, and they find out that you can put on a, a fight that generates half a billion dollars in one night. You're going to take that swing. You're going to find a way to try to make it happen again. Yeah. Uh, and um, so. Um, Conor McGregor versus a crocodile. <laughs> no, I think, I think um, you know, um, I just happened to watch last night the Bobby Riggs. Oh, yeah. Battle of the Sexes. The Battle of the Sexes. How was that? And, and um, it was a, a, an average film. I covered that event, yeah. believe it or not. Sure, and, wow. Um, and I knew Billie Jean King from the time she was 16 years old, and they didn't really portray her as she was, as she was. And uh, why do you say that? Well, because they made they made her into the 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 kind of docile, uh, uncertain uh, woman that supposedly she was part of the feminist movement of the time, which she was. But she was this feisty, out loud fun person but they they needed i suppose for dramatic reasons to have somebody who wasn't the female version of bobby Ray. right sure yeah, she was plenty brash yeah so i found that you know interesting that they had to do that and i was watching the film through the eyes of you know how much of this is reality and how much how much of this really happened and so my guess is is that uh, floyd mayweather uh, next will find uh, uh in in 5 or 10 years will find some uh heavyweight woman that uh, he can appoint <laughs> well that does seem that does seem kind of like what bobby riggs was doing at the time was... yeah well riggs had been uh, you know a really top tennis player who won wimbledon won the us open and he was a terrific fun personality and knew how to uh, had had to scratch every itch out there in the, in in the movement. 
and it was a really great event in Houston. I had uh, covered the previous one with when he played Margaret Court Smith, who was at that time uh, the top player and women player in the world down here in, near San Diego. Um, so it, it was another um, Ollie-like event uh, that uh, I, as a writer, was was involved with. You know, it's funny. I was in a, a pro am. I'll tell you this quickly, and I'm gonna let you go. I was in a pro am, and I was playing with Billie Jean King doubles. Uh, doubles. Really? Dance. It was a, it was a uh, uh, you know, it was a benefit for cystic mm-hmm. fibrosis. So, well, and I was so excited to be teamed with uh, with with her. And it was like a, it was a short set, and we're playing against uh, another like television person, like myself, was in TV, and then John Lloyd, I think, was the pro mm-hmm. on the other mm-hmm. side. Yeah. So I'm. Uh, Who I'm, was married to Chris? Uh, uh, Heber, it's Heber, right? Right. right. So I serve to John Lloyd, and I double fault, okay? And Billie Jean King, I'll never forget, she picked up the ball on the court, and she brought it over to me. This is just so, uh, it speaks to how feisty and competitive. She gave me the ball, and she said, it's okay to double fault to him, but if you double fault to the amateur, I will fucking kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the Billie Jean I knew. That's really great. You know, when she came off the court's, uh, the public courts of Southern California, as Pancho Gonzalez did, a Mexican American and who was a great tennis player and was one of her idols. And she used to say she wanted to make it a, a sport for for everybody, not just for the for the uh, for the rich and and the, the country club types. And that was her goal when she was 16 years old and uh, already. Uh, a presence in the game. Yeah, she changed everything uh, as, uh, you know, has been well documented. They can never thank her enough. The, she the... was a Jackie Robinson of, of the women's movement. Yeah. Hey, by the way, just because we're on tennis and then I really will let you go. I'm really of the belief that they shouldn't make the guys play best three out of five. I don't know. It's a tradition. Should you play four quarters? Should you play nine innings? Um, it's considered a test of endurance uh, yeah. of, of not just talent, but of stamina and will um and that's the tradition of of the sport listen they used to have matches that that went eight or nine sets because uh they went be, beyond uh yeah no tiebreakers there were no tiebreakers and then because of television and because of the patience of fans i suppose uh, we have uh, uh, tiebreakers over the last, I don't know, quarter of a century. I'm not sure. Yeah, I just think that you'd extend careers. And, you know, it, tennis is a meat grinder on the, on the body. You know, you'd see, I think, a lot. And some of these guys like Nadal and Federer who have been good for tennis and other players coming up, I just feel like their, their careers would be extended and to be good for the game of tennis. Well, I think that uh, maybe, I think that Nadal and, and, and uh, uh, others have shown that, um, that they could, they have the stamina. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, like, you know that modern conditioning compared and, to old time uh, enables them. And I think most of the champions will go. Well, then I'll win in three. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Um, and m- most often uh, we don't get five set sets. It's it's um, um, we get three sets and with with or four sets. And with the great fighters, we don't get. The fight is going twelve rounds. It, it, uh, um, we had two two so-called heavyweight championship fights in the last uh, week, and uh, both of them ended in the first round. When was the decision to go from fifteen to twelve rounds? Was that a TV decision? Actually, not. But maybe so. Maybe you could more easily stick a twelve-round fight into an hour show than you could a fifteen-round fight. It was claimed at the time that it was healthier for the athletes. Uh, also, in 15-round fights, um, fighters tended to take a few rounds off. Right. And once the fight got into the middle rounds and it looked like it wasn't going to end abruptly, um, they they started to um, try to just survive. So. Uh, we would get as, as theoretically, and I think in actuality, as, as much action in 12 rounds as we often used to get in 15. Was there outcry at the time when they made the change? Well, I think some traditionalists, but not a great outcry. No, I think it came along at a time when 
uh, it was perceived as being good for boxing that um, um, that the guy who won in 12 was usually the guy who would win in 15. We've seen fights here and there when when we've been a- able to think or say that, well, if it had gone 15, it might have changed. But uh, most often, uh, the, the better guy wins, uh, and it could have gone 10 rounds and gotten the same result. Hey, the night of the Tyson Holyfield incident, which he bit that ear off. Were you at that fight? No, doing I was it? not. That was not our fight. Okay. And what did you think would happen to Tyson as a result of that? Well, it was so unprecedented. I didn't know. I thought he'd be uh, suspended for a good long time. But a, we don't have national rules for that. So if you get suspended in Vegas, and he did get basically suspended in Vegas before he fought um, Lennox Lewis the first time. Well, the fight turned up in Memphis. Right, or right. it can turn up in San Antonio, so there's an incentive to overlook as much as the local commissions go, could overlook. Because, like all commissions, they're there not only to supervise the sport, but to uh, help the promoters uh, keep it going. Sure. Um, so there's a, a personal incentive as well. But I, I, he was involved. You know, he still claims. <laughs> That that was all Holyfield's fault, you know. Right, because of the headbutting, was that because it? Because of, you know, which, you know, uh, Holyfield was a very tough, rough character, but he was roughhousing and not allowing Tyson to get off his punches. And I, it was just on the right side of the rules. Um, but what Holyfield beat Tyson both times on was that he just had, he was just really tougher inside than, than Tyson was. Uh, he was a stronger willed. And it was what it was. I mean, do you know how hard it is to bite off a piece of another human's flesh? Oh, man. No, actually. <laughs> okay, none of us do, but just imagine that. Yeah, how much anger yeah. and rage that Tyson felt. Um, and that, you know, deciding that he was going to impose street justice on, on a fight with or right. an, uh, an event with rules. All right. Oh, God, yeah, it was wild. I, I was in the arena that night. It was the closest I'd ever uh, sat to the ring. And I, I couldn't believe it. And I thought, oh, my God, they'll throw him out of fighting forever. But, of course, you're right. Uh, it happened two more times. <laughs> People don't often remember that. Yeah. I mean, he... But it he bit. He tried to chew off a piece of Lennox Lewis's thigh during a a, a weigh-in ceremony. Right, you can I imagine remember that. that. That's how threatened he felt. And then there was another fight when uh, he he chewed into some second-rate opponent's chest because you know, he no longer could be the, the Mike Tyson of uh, who who reached his the end of his career started when he was 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Right, and he's now reconstituted himself as this charming guy on the talk shows, right? Which is to his credit no. that that you know he's he's done some examining of himself in public, and um, he's not stupid, but he was a you know at, at, at the time that he was fighting, he was a virtually a, a psychopath. Right. Um, he didn't have control over what he did, but I've heard that. Uh, there are a lot of CEOs of big corporations who are psychopaths as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. Not the only one. You know, my pal Sam Simon, who died, he was a huge uh, boxing aficionado, and he actually managed Lehman Brewster. Mm-hmm. And you'll remember. I remember that. Yeah, to the to the heavy was it the heavyweight championship? Yes, yeah, when he beat Klitschko here. That's right. Be, yeah, managed by a comedy writer, <laughs> but, right? Who and and of course in the in in, in the best tradition of, uh, of boxing, Booster abandoned him as soon as he could. Yeah, that's the way it works, huh? Well, and it works the other way in different ways, uh, where the fighter is uh, most often taken advantage of. Right. Sure. Wow, it, it's such a pleasure. Thank you for letting us kind of play the lily pad of conversation here with different stuff. It's such a pleasure to talk to you, Larry. Well, uh, thank you, guys. Um, and um, hey, I'm by, still standing, and so is boxing. Yeah, indeed. Hey, <laughs> by the we're way, glad about both. you know, you're 86. You'd think you're, you might be senior ranking officer on deck as a guest, but we've had Norman Lloyd here. He was 100 years old well, when he appeared. Yes. Well, my, if you can't. If you can't fix boxing and you can't kill it, my guess is I can't be fixed, but I can be killed. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a lot of fun, man. Thanks, Larry Merchant. Thank you, guys. All Thank right, you. see you. 
Get more of The Edge on Stitcher and iTunes or go to our website, edge-show.com. Hey, everybody. Why don't you do me a favor and like The Edge with Mark Thompson on Facebook? Yeah, that's going to bring in the kids.